so let me try this on you. Um, again, from an epistemological perspective, uh, you know, trying to understand what it is exactly that's coded in terms of evolutionary psychology, what it is that's coded in our genes. So I, I'm just going to divide kind of uh, human experiences and, or human, I'm not sure exactly what the general title here. We've got certain inclinations. Um, we've got emotions and we've got ideas. Now to me, ideas are not something that can be encoded because epistemologically ideas come from our interaction with reality and we have to be alert and aware and a reasoning being in order to get ideas. But I can see inclinations being encoded. Does that make sense? So it depends you. how you define, I'm not being postmodern on no, you. No, but no, no, it no, that does yeah. depend how you define it. Yeah. Everything depends exactly. on how you define it. <laughs> so let's take an example. Yeah. Uh, and then you tell me whether this is an idea or whether it's an inclination to use your nomenclature. Sure. So let's say uh, how we respond to beauty or how we specifically respond to beautiful faces. Yeah. So evolutionary psychologists argue that all other things considered, uh, a more symmetric face is across the world viewed as more beautiful than an asymmetric face uh, because of certain uh, signals that symmetry uh, exudes or, or, or uh, embodies. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So now the question becomes, well, is, is, is that something that is learned or is that something that is inscribed? And the way that you would test that in this case, uh, there are many ways to establish that something is part of our biological blueprint. One of the ways is through developmental psychology. You could take children who are not yet at the age whereby they could be socialized. By definition, they haven't reached that cognitive developmental stage. You could show them photos of people's faces that vary on symmetry, and then you could simply watch how long they gaze at one, yeah. or the first one that they gaze at, or the first one that they try to, uh, you know, touch. How right? young so could you do this with with kids? You could, you could, pr around six months old. I think wow. the study that I'm thinking wow. of is, uh, wow. you know, maybe six to nine months old. Okay. Uh, similar thing you do, for example, with toy preferences, yeah. uh, because the social constructivists will argue that it's it's the socialization of teaching little boys to play with blue yeah. trucks and teaching little girls to play with pink dolls that starts the cascade of gender role socialization. Well, you could take children who, again, are cognitively speaking too young, they're infants, six months old, nine months old, and you could show that they already exhibit those sex-specific preferences. So what, so what evolutionary psychology has is a very, very broad range of data that it can use to unequivocally demonstrate that something is uh, as part of our biological heritage, which, by the way, speaks to something that really annoys me uh, from the detractors of evolutionary psychology when they argue that evolutionary psychology is pseudoscience where you just come up with just so stories. It is the exact opposite of that that serious evolutionary psychologists do. Because what to, to really build an adaptive argument, to argue that something is an adaptation, you have to build what... Uh, so I, I talk about this in one of my recent papers, nomological networks of cumulative evidence. What does that mean? You have to find data stemming from different cultures, different time periods, uh, uh, different paradigms, different methodologies, all of which point to the unassailable truth of that statement that you're making. Charles Darwin himself had done exactly that sure. in, in, in Origin of Species. Yeah. Now, he didn't call it nomological networks, but what did he do? Over a 30-year period, he collected tons of data from radically different sources. Once you put it together, you can't counter his natural selection argument. And so, uh, so to, to, to go back to your question, so, I, so is, the, is, is the innate preference for certain beauty markers an inclination or an idea? So I suspect it's an inclination that then we build ideas over. So, so, you know, so there are a number of things. So one is I've met a lot of women who, you know, wow, beautiful. And then after 10 minutes, they look like unbelievably ugly to me, right? Because- You know, like their personalities. Yes, because their personalities have come through and it changes how I look at their face, right? So, and, and so that, that to me is, yes, the inclination is there, but once I learn more about what beauty means to me today, is more than the symmetry because I've integrated that preference with a whole set of other ideas. And now when I see their personality, I can't even see the beauty anymore. It's gone. So they're not beautiful to me anymore. Um, 
uh, of course, you know, artists know, and, and Michelangelo and, and uh, Da Vinci and all of those great artists all knew that the certain symmetries, the certain patterns, the certain, you know, pyramids of shapes that human, the human being responds to positively in a way that they don't respond to other things. Certainly, to use a Jordan Peterson thing, we don't respond well to chaos, right? Uh, right. You know, unless you're a modern artist, and, and we can talk a lot about modern art, but, but, but in terms of real art, um, you know, the, we don't respond well to chaos. We respond to certain patterns, and, and, and I think that's, that's an inclination. I mean, I don't know the science you do, and, and it, sounds like, it sounds like there's, but I think we build on that. So we take an inclination, and then we build an abstract idea of beauty that's got a foundation in our inclinations that becomes the idea of beauty. Right, and so I guess maybe that also relates to more broadly the idea, for example, of a meme to a memeplex, right? A meme is the sort of smallest unit of, it could be an idea that spreads from brain to brain yep. using uh, something akin to, you know, the propagation of genes. The memeplex is the collection of ideas. So religion is a memeplex, whereas uh, a singular ad slogan would be just a meme, yep. right? So I think that's what you're speaking of. You you have a set of biological inclinations on which we then build a, a bigger edifice of ideas. Fair yeah, enough. I think epistemologically they're different because the one is in a sense somehow coded, ingrained, and the other we have to gain evidence from reality and apply reason. And I think the only way to do this is by application of reason, integrate, but, but the foundation is there with that inclination. So that inclination right. serves as the as the... I don't know, a foundation on which you build a house, right? Uh, and, and, and I would say, so just to, to build on what you're saying, so take, for example, something like the the uh, the innate, If I, people, some people don't like the term innate, yep, but yep. colloquially we understand what it means. Take the innate penchant for men to seek social status, right? So the, the universal is, if you like, the Darwinian rule is seek social status. Now, the manner by which you instantiate that will vary across individuals. And that, by the way, shows you that it's not deterministic, right? So yeah. you and I share a common desire to ascend the social hierarchy because that will get us greater access to women. But I may choose to do it by becoming a famous professor. You may choose to do it by being a great diplomat or a painter or a soccer player or whatever it is that you choose. So that's what then creates behavioral heterogeneity, right? Because a lot of people think, oh, but if something is a human universal, that implies that every single outcome will be exactly the same. We will all know. We can instantiate the same Darwinian rule in radically different ways. But so, so this is where I've got a problem, right? Because okay. social status is not something that I think in terms of and, and think about the world in terms of. Um, you know, I, I want to be good at what I'm, I'm good at and I do, because I want to be good at it because it, 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 it adds to my self-esteem. It, 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 it hurts me. I'm not looking for women, as my wife will tell you. Um, <laughs> and, and I don't think about, you know, you, may, you know, the social, with social media, I think about what other people are doing, right? Because, because you measure it in terms of likes and stuff like that. But in most of what I do in life, I don't think about how this affects other people. I think about whether what I'm doing is true and right or good. And, and often I lose people more when I, when I do something yeah. on Twitter or something than I gain. So I never, I've never throughout my life ever thought in terms of social status or found myself seeking it qua social status rather than I want to be the best that I can be at what I am doing for me. This this relates a little bit to the to the selfishness before, but um, <laughs> that sounds like Ayn Rand, yes. Yes, and and yeah. you know Ayn Rand's where I come from, <laughs> so um, so I, I I think if I think about uh, if I think about particularly you know I don't know a Galileo doesn't seem like what he's doing is to attain women. I mean he's doing it because he's 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 got a passion for the truth and he's trying to he's trying to prove and 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 he's and he's following where reason will take him rather so than following I, where his need for I, sex takes him. Are you ready? Sure. <laughs> uh, as if I hadn't already blown your mind, get ready to have your mind blown. What you're describing is the difference between epistemologically one of the most important things to know about evolutionary theorizing, and that is the difference between proximate explanations 
and ultimate explanations, okay? okay? Proximate explanations explain the how and what of a phenomenon. Most of what scientists do and have done throughout all of recorded history has been at the proximate level. Most Nobel Prizes are won at the proximate level. It explains how a mechanism works. Yep. What are the factors that affect the mechanism? The ultimate explanation, ultimate doesn't mean superior, it's ultimate, it's better. Ultimate in the Darwinian sense. Yep. It is the ultimate Darwinian why. Why would the phenomenon have evolved to be of that form, right? So even though you may not do the things that you do with a conscious recognition that the ultimate goal is to get women, your behavioral system, your emotional system, your cognitive system at the proximate level has evolved to pursue things that ultimately cater to that ult ultimate goal. Do you follow what I mean? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so even though you don't say, I'm getting up today to write a book because hopefully I'll get a lot of hot women to have sex with me, you care about your reputation. You care about people liking your ideas. You don't wake up every day and say, here's what I plan to do today. I plan to be lazy, apathetic, and hopefully say as many dumb things as I can on as broad a public forum as possible, <laughs> right? So therefore, even though you don't consciously appear as though you are slave, quote, to the ultimate goal, that is what you're doing. So Galileo, cared greatly about what his colleagues thought of him, and whether we like it or not, it ultimately relates to some fundamental ultimate goals. Did you follow what I'm saying? Yeah, so why does some, so I've, a few, a lot of questions actually. Okay. So why does some people are lazy and do nothing and go on you know, social media and say stupid things that, oh. that, that, are, that are turning them into the opposite of, of, of what would attract because the random combination of each of our genes that makes our unique personhoods are such that we don't every single moment of every day pursue life as though we are perfect executors of these biological drives, right? If that yeah. were the case, then we would be these perfect beings, right? I mean, why do people succumb to anorexia nervosa? Uh, why do people get addicted to heroin, right? So, uh, but, and if you, I can answer that very quickly. So it, in two of my books, I talk about exactly that question. If we are such adaptive creatures, I mean, this speaks to your point, why sure. do people do stupid sure. shit, right? Yeah. If we are these adaptive creatures, why do we succumb to maladaptive realities? And the way that I answer it in a grand sense without getting into the details, is that each of these cases, anorexia nervosa, uh, uh, pornographic addiction, pathological gambling, are misfirings of adaptive processes. Do you follow what I mean? So yep. there is an adaptive yep. process, which if it fires within the adaptive range, leads to good outcomes. But soft, sometimes it's more inactive. Sometimes it's more hyperactive. And that, by the way, cancer is that. Sure, sure. Right? Yep. And so, yep. so, so I think you could totally put within the rubric of evolutionary uh, theorizing the why we all sorts of stupid shit. Yeah. So, so I would say that those people are not engaging their reason and and defaulting to to, to to being determined by the misfiring. But if you engage your reason, you're not susceptible to that. So reason is, is, is really the evolutionary tool that allows us to take control over that and not to leave ourselves at the random whim of the misfiring. But do you think that in all circumstances, your capacity to have access to that that reason faculty is always there so for example i am a heroin addict at that moment uh it is impossible for me to engage yeah. what you're calling my reason faculty no question I have it, a phys okay. it, if you screw yourself up enough times right if you if you default on the capacity to reason enough times you will lose the capacity to bring it back or at least under under some circumstances you know maybe if you go sober and you completely, uh, you know, redo your life and you rethink it, then you can get on the right track. But it takes a lot of work. Reason takes a lot of work. Falling off of reason, you know, ignoring reason, becoming a religious mystic, whatever, um, is easy. And, and then going back to reason would, would, would take a lot of work. But I think that what makes us human is our, is our ability to override, right? Our ability to take control over all these influences, the misfirings, the and, 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 to, and, to, and to really channel our lives in a positive direction. 
Um, so let me ask you. Let me let me ask you this. So if I am, so we know that both men and women have evolved both a desire to pair bond, yep. uh, and also to stray. In other words, yep. we we are certainly animals that uh, wish to have sexual variety. Uh, so if I am married and uh, I have a wonderful wife whom I don't wish to lose, but there is an opportunity for me to uh, execute. Uh, my Darwinian program of seek multiple, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, sexual yeah. uh, conquest. Uh, how would I uh, seek my reason faculty to go through this particular choice? I, I mean, I, I, you know, the, the essence of it is to think, right? What, what are the consequences of the action? What is the consequences short term? What are the, more importantly, what are the consequences long term? Does this involve dishonesty towards my wife? If it involves dishonesty towards my, life, my wife, what does that lead to? One of the best things Jordan Peterson does, in my view, is his discussion on honesty. It's, it's, his discussions on honesty are you know, brilliant because I think dishonesty is very, very damaging and very, very harmful to you and therefore to the people surrounding you. So, so if you're not engaging your reason, then hey, there's a hot chick at the bar, you know, and, and, right. and, and uh, Ben Shapiro has used that example to criticize many of my views. You know, if you're an egoist, then, hey, there's a hot chick at the bar. You just go and have the hot chick. But no, if you really care about your life, then you stop and you think, okay, yeah, there's a hot chick on, my, on the bar. I, I might get some pleasure from sleeping with her, although, again, even there, I think sexual pleasure is not only physical. It's also spiritual, and therefore it, it, it has a dimension that is affected by who you're sleeping with. Uh, just like beauty is impacted by who is beautiful. Um, and therefore, I engage my reason and say, eh, it's probably, you know, given that I'm probably going to have to lie to my wife about this and, uh, um, and I've got a contract with her and I'll be violating the contract. Now, we can discuss whether the contract is valid and whether there should be a contract, but, but then we'll really get into trouble if we, if we so do that. But, but, so I would say that's where reason comes in and, and, you, and you don't act on the impulse you act as a human being, that's the difference between us and animals, is we don't act on the impulse, the animal doesn't have a choice, we have a choice, free will if you will, to act on the decision, on, to think it through and to analyze the consequences. And some of us do that, and some of us don't. We, we know lots of guys who don't do that. So, so at one point you said, you know, uh, honesty, don't yep. lie. And by the way, when it comes to these kinds of issues, I'm very much of a deontological guy. There, there are absolute truths that you should follow. Yes. But then later you said, uh, well, you know, we think about the consequences, which leads to another set of ethical, you know, uh, rubric, which is consequentialism, right? So uh, a deontological would be, I never lie. Yes. It's so, an absolute statement. But why don't you lie? Okay, why, so but, why did you come to that deontological conclusion? See, I would say that I came to that deontological conclusion, that absolute, unequivocal, moral decision, because I've evaluated the consequence and have generalized that lying, given my nature as a rational being, given the consequence it has, is a bad thing. I do that once, I come up with a principle, and then I never lie again. So here's my, uh, forgive me, I'm, I'm, I'm no, no, offering, that's fine. Uh, we're, we're, we're playing devil's advocate yep. because otherwise we'll agree on most things and people will get upset while these two guys were doing a, I hate that term, circle jerk. I oh, despise that term. Stupid. Uh, yeah. It's stupid. It's such a vulgar term. Yeah. But anyways, uh, so let me ask you this then. Isn't it the position that you're taking potentially unfalsifiable in the following way, right? It reminds me of how uh, uh, the, the classical economists would argue that any choice that you make is ultimately yeah. what the manifestation of maximizing your yes. utility is, yes. right? So therefore, that which I do is what led, w w I arrived at through my yeah. reason. So what about the guy who says, I am going to weigh all the calculus that Yaron just did, and from my reason calculus, Great. it makes perfect sense for me to potentially take the risk to sleep with this really beautiful girl with the beautiful behind. Yeah, and, 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 and be dishonest. No, I think that's a, that's a great question and an appropriate question. The, 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 I think there are absolute moral standards, so, so the deontological standards, that uh, you can say that being dishonest is wrong always. Now, I know that by induction from experience, that is by inducing, not just from my experience, from knowing human nature, understanding how reason functions, 
the, the destructive role dishonesty has in your own mind, not just other people, all of that. I know that through both seeing the world out there, understanding my own nature. So morality, the moral principle, should be those absolute principles that are consistent with human flourishing, with individual human success. And, and, and that's what morality should study. So this is where, you know, put on my moral philosopher hat. So this is Aristotle, like Aristotle's project was, uh, the goal should be individual human flourishing. How, how, do, we, how do we get there, right? What, what, are the, what are the principles that lead us to individual human flourishing? I think that's what morality should study, right? It shouldn't study sacrifice and how to treat other people devoid of purpose. It should study what are the things that lead to successful human flourishing scientifically. And this is where science and morality go high in hand. And I think it doesn't take much to show, for example, that dishonesty is scientifically bad for you, for every human being, qua human being. So that if that person is doing that calculus, eh, you know, then he's deceiving himself and he's, he's taking an action that's bad for him. And this is why I disagree with economists. I think people do things that are bad for them all the time. I think people are not utility maximizing, maximizers. I wish, you know, given that if utility meant anything, I wish they were utility maximizers, but they're not. They do stupid things. On th they don't think. They don't engage their reason. They don't evaluate. So, yes, I think there are moral principles that, that hopefully every human being at some point discovers and integrates them and then never violates them. So, uh, look, uh, one side of me very much agrees with you that there are a set of deontological principles that I like to live my life by, uh, almost to the point of it being maladaptive. So my, my mother used to always say, you know, Gad, the world doesn't operate according to your purity bubble. And what she was referring to yeah. was the fact that I was this sort of very, very pure guy who lived by standards that just the world is going to constantly violate and I'm going to be unhappy. That's but why you've been successful. Hand, well, thank you. I would uh, say, but, yeah. on the, but on the other hand, uh, I also think that we have behavioral plasticity, uh, right? So, and again, that speaks to the earlier point that we talked about when we, we talked about determinism, right? Yeah. So uh, the same uh, behavioral strategy might be optimal in condition A, but might be suboptimal in condition B. So for example, if I were to abide by the deontological statement, I never lie. Yeah. And then my wife, whose birthday is tomorrow, comes to me with that dress and says, yeah. hey dad, do I look fat in that dress? Why is that the example all guys always bring up when discussing honesty? Always. <laughs> but because it's hey, we're Darwinian beings and that's one of the places where yes. we are oftentimes forced to lie. And then you have two choices at that point. You either adhere to the deontological position or you go, no, sweetie, you look gorgeous. So all human knowledge is contextual. Okay. And, and, and the context has to be taken into account. I, I, me and my wife, you know, we, we have a certain game, right, with regard to the dress, right? And with her, the game is I have to tell her the truth. Otherwise, she'll really be angry. Um, <laughs> and... and but, but most people don't. Most people, there's a game. Do I look fat? And you expect it to say, no, you look beautiful. It's amazing. Right. And, and it's a game. And it's not about reality because no, everybody participating in the game knows that's a game. There are other examples. If, if the Nazi comes knocking at my door and says, where are the kids? I want to take them to concentration right. camp. Of course you lie because the context, is, the context of every decision should be your life, right? right. Life. So if, if, if nobody has a right to anything, including the truth, at the expense of your life, right? So, so, so the life has to be, is always the context in which every deontological context, concept, you know, fits in. Right. So, so yes, I think the universals within the context, the no, you know, I, I don't consider, I don't, you know, lifeboat scenarios are a lot of morality. When you take a morality class, it's usually yeah. the trolley. You push one lever, yeah. you kill five right. people, another lever, you kill 10. And my argument, who cares? I mean, first of all, it's not, that's not morality. That's just stupid. It's, it, you're never going to be in that trolley. Morality is about what you do every day in your life. Morality is about how you live your life. It's not about trolleys. It's not about lifeboats. In a lifeboat scenario, it doesn't matter what you do. You're screwed either way. Right? And with a trolley, you're screwed either way. There's no right answer. But in life, there are right answers. So yes, there are going to be exceptions that are emergencies or just unusual circumstances. But 99.9% .9 of the time, there are principles that guide your life that should lead you to success and happiness and flourishing. 
and, and, and we've got you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of years of human experience to, to, to show us that it, that, it, that it tends to work. So what would be, say, the top three that you could think of that you use to guide your daily actions? So to me, the number one, so there's one that integrates all the others, right? Mm -hmm. And that's be rational, right? Rationality. To me, that, you know, take control over your own mind, take control over your own life. That's what rationality means. That's why I'm not dishonest, because I know that, you know, garbage in, garbage out kind of thing. You don't want to, you don't want to mess up the mechanism of, of, of dealing with facts. Um, you know, and then, and then you want to apply facts to dealing with other people. And that, to me, is justice. You want to apply rationality to every aspect of your life. So uh, reason, rationality, would be, would be kind of number one, and everything else would be a derivative of that. But Rand, we're going back to Ayn Rand, you know, came up with seven. And I think, so, so it would be rational productiveness. The idea, and this has a evolutionary psychology kind of, kind of connection, I know. It, you know, you want to be able to take care of yourself. You want to be able to put food on the table. You, you, you want to be productive in the world. You want to do things in the world to change your environment. It's where you get your self-esteem from. It's where we get our, our, our confidence about the world. Uh, you know, so you want to be independent. You can't have other people thinking for you. Thinking demands that you do the thinking. Right. Uh, you want to be just. You want to be honest. You want to have integrity. Um, I'm missing one. But, but pride is another one that's usually controversial. Um, but... Because it also goes in the seven deadly sins. It is yes. the root of all of the other sins. Exactly. Right? And to me, pride is so fundamental because you want pride, Aristotle called the queen of the virtues. Right, exactly. So Aristotle right. was the opposite of the Christian view of pride. Right. And Rand is much more Aristotelian in that sense.